This podcast is made possible by the generosity of listeners and viewers like you. Kindly consider a contribution through Patreon or PayPal. Links are in the details box. Any amount is appreciated. And follow us on social media. We're on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. The handle, The Beirut Banyan. Rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. And to stay updated with video releases, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thanks for listening, and thanks for watching. I'm Rani Shatah, and this is The Beirut Banyan. Even though we only met each other in person a few months ago, by accident, we're both at Starbucks Zal'a, and we noticed each other. We had spoken on the phone before, and we know of each other. I'm a big fan of your wife, Lori. Uh, in the background, I think I've always been a fan of the way you see Beirut. And this is something I never shared with you. I own a copy of Beirut Shot Twice. And I didn't know that that was you when I bought the book. I saw the name. I recognized the name later. But I really enjoyed that book. Because that's the closest I can get to experiencing what Beirut once looked like. And whether it's film or novels or photo collections, I yearn to rediscover a Beirut I don't know. So for that reason alone, it's an honor to do this with you. Second honor is that we just did an episode on your show, the Seha, and for me it was a privilege to talk to you about personal suffering, about many things that I see wrong in politics, but to also open up to you. I thought that was it was the right exchange with the right person. So now it's my turn. Your new book, Beirut Guilty Pleasures, I think the title speaks for itself. We're going to get into the book. We're going to get into your media career and also perhaps your life today in a country that we don't recognize in our own lifetime. But before we go down that road, to anyone that doesn't know who you are, and I think those are a few that watch this podcast or listen, I think the majority know who you are. But if you had to explain yourself to a complete stranger who never met Zaven, how would you define yourself? Are you a journalist? Are you a storyteller? Are you something else? I know you from TV. I know you from media and alternative media. And I know you from books. But I'd like you to define yourself to me. First, hi. It's uh, also a, a big pleasure for me to be here in your show. Uh, and I've been waiting. Like <laughs> 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 I felt I was <laughs> in a queue. <laughs> You're, when you're when will he call me? 350. <laughs> when he, when will he call me? I was like, <laughs> um, so thank you for inviting me. I had me. to do two episodes with Lori first, and then I got to you. <laughs> um, uh, really, it's a pleasure for me, and thank you for inviting me. I'm very happy to be here. Uh, how would I define myself? Really, it's very tough because some sometimes it's embarrassing. Sometimes I, I haven't. I haven't uh, I, I, like I haven't introduced myself for 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 many years, mm. and then suddenly with new generation showing up and asking questions and not watching TV anymore and mm. not knowing who I am, so suddenly you go back and you feel like you're going thirty years, yeah, backwards, and you have to uh, identify yourself or you have to introduce yourself, and introducing yourself as a media personality or a TV host is. A bit strange because when you say a television host or a talk show host, mm. like w what comes next is I should know this person and I don't right. know this person. Yeah. So it's embarrassing, but um, usually I say I'm a journalist. I feel that's mm. me. That's what I've always wanted to, to do. I'm mm. a journalist. I'm a researcher. I'm Zavan. The so. <laughs> <laughs> thing is because I, I feel the same way, but at a much smaller scale. I think it's hard to describe who I am to somebody that doesn't know. But you see, I'm very comfortable with people that uh, who with people who don't know me, mm, because mm. I feel that I can be Zavan the person and not Zavan with with 
who Zavan is, the, right. the, the, the public figure, the person they know on TV, or also the, pers- the, the person that they might have a, a perception of, or mm. they might mm. have a, a, an, a, a, a prejudgment, or you know, some, like I, yeah. any feeling towards, whether it's love, hate, respect, disrespect. So uh, when people don't know me, I feel I'm, uh, I'm free of my 30 mm. years of being on television. You know, I'm refreshingly surprised and rather glad you're saying this. I didn't expect that. I think I feel the opposite. I feel uncomfortable. I feel like I'm obligated to explain who I am. And I don't necessarily always like what I'm saying. But it's great to hear somebody completely relaxed where they are. And the reason I'm saying it this way is because your career has, in a way... It reflects the media landscape as it's evolved the last 20 years. And that's not an easy journey. And I think there's only a handful of people that I recognize from traditional media that have succeeded in alternative media. The first thing that comes to mind is Diana Malid. I think she's, uh, she's doing fantastic work in Daraj Media. And in a way, she found her niche there. But I never really thought of her as a TV personality. That was more news and maybe more more reporting. I think of you as a bit more flexible with that definition. And I vaguely remember you were on Facebook long ago before anyone was doing anything on Facebook. You were there. And I think you found an independent way to remain comfortable in this difficult landscape. So that's my way of saying thank you for actually saying something which is good, which is you're comfortable even when the climate is not so clear. I'm going to take you back, before we get into this book, I want to take you back to the time that I recognize you. And it's sometimes it's a thrill to watch you show your wedding uh, anniversary photos on Instagram or Facebook. I'm like, oh my God, yes, we've all grown up. <laughs> you showed a lovely collage of wedding photos from maybe 20 years ago or so. That's no, exactly 20 years. Exactly 20 years. And yeah. that's the event I remember. Uh, I don't know how you stay young and healthy. I don't know how you do it. You look fantastic still. I've expired. <laughs> but you reminded me that it's not that long ago. There were only a few channels people were watching in Lebanon. There were a handful of names that were celebrity. And you were one of them. And uh, when I think of myself, and I don't only think of myself as Lebanon. Mm. I say the Arab world. Mm. Right. So you always found yourself more than yeah. just this little geography. I see. May I ask but my, my yeah. roots are here in Lebanon. But I've always, always seen my career as I'm talking to the whole of the Arab world or right. Arab-speaking audience mm. everywhere. In the USA, in Australia, in Canada. So. so it's a bit of an odd question. But did you find that that was easier to do when things were simpler? It was never simpler. Mm. It always had complications. There were mm. always like uh, different ideas, ideologies, uh, mm. and conflict. But I've always found my way of how to go through all those, uh, you know, conflicts. Yeah. And to stay as real as possible to myself and to my audience and uh, and uh, for the people who are looking for something different on TV. Uh, mm. I think what, like. The, my special uh, attribute yeah. in my show is that I was always surprising people who were watching me mm. with new ideas. I was mm. always I, I always had the ability to refresh myself, to renew myself, to update myself, and always to surprise the audience. Mm. And uh, this was good for me. And this might make you less popular on TV. Mm. Yeah. But uh, I always felt myself, well, if you want, my, like how I describe myself, I always describe myself as opening doors, trying to widen your limits, trying to be more free, more flexible, more updated, more real on television. I'm glad that you're able to describe yourself that way. I thought of you as pushing boundaries. Yes. And I found you actually one of the, in a way, a pioneer when it came to looking beyond television 
Yes, and and this is what I'm trying today. Uh, well, this is what I'm trying to do today. Mm, mm. Like I tried it when I was twenty-two, yeah, thirty-two, forty-two, and forty-two is like it was my biggest failure. Oh, because when I was forty-two, suddenly I realized that social media is getting bigger than yeah. television, and yeah. I'm the television person. Right. So I stopped all my platforms. Yeah. And I started fighting Facebook and Twitter. Fighting. Fighting. Oh. So because I wanted people like after I I I I, I did I consider myself unless I had I'm not saying it as like No no this is who you yeah, are. I mean, yeah, this is my work. I've yeah. worked I've worked hard for this. And those were decisions that I took and I'm very proud. And it was not always like pinky and happy. Yeah. Uh, sometimes I lost people. Uh, viewers, uh, viewership, mm. popularity, money, but I wanted to. T- I I like to explore and yeah, to experiment. Me. But let yeah. me tell you this. Mm. So when I was forty-two, after like doing this bridge between social media or the new media mm. and the online culture and mm. television, which was to- like something very new mm. uh, for for Lebanon and for the Arab world, because we're talking here about the person who had the first laptop on TV, first email from television and to television, yeah. first online broadcast, first uh, first person to start his show on television and to continue it on uh, on uh, social media. Yeah. Um, I forgot all these things you used to do them. Now they're yeah. coming back to me. So you integrated internet early yes, on. Yes, yes. Yeah. So when I, when, I, when I was like 42, I don't remember wh- what year was that. I suddenly felt that social media is getting bigger than my TV work. Mm. And I started seeing that people are, are following me on or w- are knowing or quoting me on sentences I'm saying on Facebook and not on television. Right. Or they, they are knowing, like they are watching me on Facebook more than watching me on future TV. And for me, this was like, mm. well, this is not happening because the main place is television. And this is something like, It's the plus yeah. for television. It's it's the it's to it's a kind of mar- to market my TV work. Yeah, uh, that's not the real media. That's marketing tools for my work. Right. So I I decided to stop. And now, when I'm 52, I'm trying to to have this new uh, uh, like new experience, new venture, new adventure, whatever, on social media. Uh, doing online shows addressed to younger audiences, audiences who are new to politics, mm-hmm. and audiences who don't watch television. I want to explore that difficult stage with you because I know it in a superficial level. And I know that you, in a way, withdrew from the media landscape in general. Yet, when you came back, it's almost like there's a it's, it's, a, it's a proper comeback. Because without you in the media sphere, there's someone that's missing. And I felt it. But I also feel that the challenge is real. And I didn't know that you were fighting against it. So c- can we go into that difficult territory? You saw that social media was becoming, was giving you, was giving people more exposure than traditional media. And you wanted to confront that. Yes. And also I felt that social media is like a beast. It's taking us to fake news. Yeah. It's taking us to more sensationalism. Mm-hmm. It's taking us to be more fake. It's taking us to be like working 24 hours. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, it's yeah. taking us to, to, it's like a beast. You yes. have to feed it with blood. <laughs> And once you stop that, it will attack. Yeah. Or another beast will come or mm. another, you know. We're not meant to be 24 hours mm-hmm. in, in the public eye. Mm. We're not meant to work 24 hours. We're meant to to work like normal hours. Normal eight hours. hours, ten no, hours. No, no, yeah. we're no, no, not even that. We're meant like when I say we're meant to be like to work for maybe for twenty four hours, seven days, nonstop. Mm. But the end result should be very specific in specific time, in specific place. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So with social media, there's nothing specific anymore. You have to be present all the time. But you're now in a situation where, we're going to fast forward a bit. I feel the same way you do. 10 years ago, we're 10 years apart in age, but we're going through the same journey. Mm. I'm uncomfortable with social media too, and I, I avoided it 
for up until three years ago, I didn't use it. No, no, it's not a matter of me being comfortable of. I'm comfortable with social media, but social media for me is still not a job. Yeah, sorry, I meant the way you were describing it, the the feeding the beast with red meat yeah. and and making sure that you can, not making sure, living an insane life, which is 24-hour uh, communication without much... Uh, without much output or outcome, I felt the same in, uh, discomfort. But you have found a way to actually reintroduce yourself through social media. So in those years, was it that you were waiting for the right time to sort of push back and say that I can handle that beast on my terms? Or is it just a matter of things had to line up in a way that made sense to you? No, I think I think like it's like uh, it's like uh, the, like everything new. So you have this boom that happens, and then things start to settle down. Mm. So uh, I think now social media and the new platforms have like are settling down a little bit, yeah. and they are going back because if this is new media, media has principles. Yeah. Whether you were yeah. on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram, on TikTok, on television, on radio, you have journalistic principles and ethics. Yeah. And you have to stand for something. For something which is not only uh, uh, attracting likes and right. clickbaits. Yeah. You have to stand for a moral, ethical value or statement. You have to be a statement. And you cannot you cannot be a statement of I'm controversial right. only right. because on traditional media, if you have a very popular show or a very uh, uh, controversial show mm. or uh, any show that attracts lo lots of attention, it's meant to bring publicity and to bring viewership for more cultured niche mm. shows. But you did that before. I, I've did everything. I've did uh, like there were there were different phases that I've went through. At, yeah. at at one point in my career, I was considered to be the bad guy on television. I was considered to be you know the trash TV on Lebanese TV, first on Tele Liban and then on Future TV, and I was very proud of that. But it was a <laughs> phase that. I've never heard it. You know, I've heard you say this before in different ways. It's always striking that you, you own it yeah, in, a, in a good way. Some people consider me that I've ruined Lebanese television. I think, honestly. But I think it was, it was a transitional phase in Lebanese television. I took Lebanese, I'm like one step further to modernity in, talk, in serious political talk shows. I'm not talking about entertainment. But with your permission, I won't, I'll, I'll only go one step further because it's something I... I don't know and I, I want to hear from you as much as you'd like to say there is a stretch of time that you were not visible at least as visible as you used to be there was a down time yes is that something that you needed before we well my end down is when future television stopped broadcast. okay so that's that's a moment where you yeah where yeah. suddenly I was like I invested in this station yeah I never left the station for mm. all the job offers I had yeah. in Lebanon and in the Gulf. Mm. Mm. I didn't care for money, for any better job, for any better opportunity because I invested in Future TV. And I thought, like, I don't want to leave this yeah. place. Yeah. Uh, when it was good, I didn't want to leave it. And when it was, like, deteriorating also, I didn't want to leave it because... Yeah. It was not the right time yeah. for me to leave when when the ship was sinking. Yeah, let's give it like a romantic visual. <laughs> when you said ship, I thought you were going to say something else, but <laughs> ship is is the right yes. <laughs> so, and then suddenly they when they stopped, and when they stopped, they like the whole thing was we will be back in two months, three months. Yeah. So at that point, I was like, do I want to continue being there? I don't want, or or not. Mm. And then I, I, I tried working in other channels, uh, not immediately. I needed like this break to reflect because when you, yeah. you, you're consuming my, yourself when you are on television every week for like 24 years. 
Yeah. Imagine 24 years yeah. every week on television with yeah. a topic that you have to come uh, with and make a discussion. So it's it's huge. So I needed this break. I took this break, and after that, I I worked in several other local channels. Uh, there were small projects, but they were. I was testing the grounds whether I can like b commit to a weekly or a daily or a monthly show, mm. and I felt with everything that you can say about Future TV, I think it was the at least for for the line of my shows and social topics it it's the most liberal channel in Lebanon you know liberal and free and and it's a conserv it's the conservative channel of Lebanon and working in it you f I felt free and really free to take whatever decision I wanted to take to discuss whatever uh, subject I wanted to to wear whatever I wanted to wear, even if there is a brand like uh, uh, showing. Mm. Um, so I felt like I need this break. I need to plus uh, plus there are l like there are three other generations of uh, TV hosts. So I'm now the old guy on TV. The old guy cannot come just to do a show to yeah. compete with the younger. Uh, presenter so I had to find my um, I had to know what I stand for on television that section where you found yourself being older or the the older generation I'm going yeah. to get to that at the end because that's something I really want to talk to you about you but know when I start talking yeah uh, in interviews about my book no, we're, we're definitely, no, no, no. That's Please, I want to talk about you know, that. That's the, that's the meat of that because episode. Because every time like, I go yeah. to, to shows, I yeah. want to talk about my book, I want to talk about uh, my political views, I, and then... Like, Zavin, I promise you the advantage of a podcast yeah. is that this is going to be the focus. But I want to say one more thing. Yeah. Hearing you talk about your age career... And no, 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 no. And career. Hearing you talk about the journey that Future TV also had, I think it's a healthy reminder that the way politics expresses itself in media has these individual stories within. And I think yours is one of the more visible ones, that there is a station that we all know, there is a host that we all know, and then we grow up, both are not there. And I think, in a way, that kind of is the journey that I like going through yeah. when I look at your book. It's re But for me, it's, it's normal. For me, it's normal. Nothing stays there forever. And especially in my case, where, where, where there are like three generations of TV hosts and TV personalities and TV names after me. So at one, at one point, I have to step down and they have, they have to come yeah. take my place. But the thing is that I was not ready. And I, uh, I, I have the ability, like not everyone can renew themselves. So I have the ability to renew myself, yeah. and um, because I'm very, my brand is very flexible on. Uh, it's very flexible on TV. You can change it the way you want, and plus I'm in. I'm okay with my age, with my knowledge, with my English, with with, with my everything. So um, you are. I felt. I felt that I. I didn't feel that I have to stay on TV. Yeah. But then I had this opportunity to open new heights in online media. We will end the episode with that snippet because that's the part I really want to explore with you at the end. But the next section is dedicated to somebody who's also survived a very difficult, uh, sometimes overwhelming journey. And I think uh, the survival story, it lives in you, it lives in me, but it's best expressed in this book. The reason you're here is really to get into a book that I've been flipping through regularly. No, the reason I'm here is because my wife came here two times and I didn't come. <laughs> Actually, that's true. And I want to be on your show. At least the book is dedicated to her. So that's... Uh, is it? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> you wrote, yes. no, not this one. Of course no, it is. No, here, Lebanon. thank you. Thank you, not that. My dear wife, Lori, for making all the difference. Mm. I mean, she wrote that. Fair sentence. enough. You wrote. You, you <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I'm joking. <laughs> it's a joke. 
That's staying in. <laughs> you know, Zaven, since you're going down that road, I'm going to mm. say something. I wouldn't share this, but now that we're talking about it, it makes sense. You kind of told me that s- uh, some of the inspiration came from the tour that I used to give. And I thought you were just being sweet, but you meant it. No, I was just being sweet. Oh, then you know what? I'll still take it and I'll go with it. <laughs> no, really. I, yeah, you inspired me for this book. See, I, I did not know that until you yeah. mentioned it. Because yeah. this book was an idea. And I was not sure whether I want to do it a book, a show, a series of TV uh, uh, mini documentaries. So I didn't know what to do. And then I decided to do a book, but there was a missing link. And then I knew about your Beirut walks. Yes. And uh, and I, I had someone who was in one of your walks and he was telling me about like the experience, what you said, mm. what you didn't say, things that he loved and things that he hated and your political views mm. and, you know. And I was like, I want to do it too. <laughs> My <laughs> too. <laughs> Uh, and one one of like at one point I wanted to be um, to to take your tour yeah take and it somewhere else <laughs> yeah and then it, I don't know why it didn't happen but I always had in my mind that I want to do the Ronis tour and like my way yeah I didn't I it's nice so this is this. why I I like I uh, I I wrote some uh, some parts of the book. Uh, as if I am in a real tour. I think the book... So I imagined a tour. You know, had you not told me that, I would have imagined this as 12 stops in Beirut. They don't necessarily need to be in order. They're not chronological. But each stop is a defining story. Yes. And each one is layered. And that's kind of the way I used to give the tour. I actually tried to bring Beirut to life physically. But in a way that showed its scars and i think this book if anything it's reflecting on 12 deep scars that both of us know very well and that's the beauty of the book with your permission i'd like to go through them one by one and i'd like to start with the most pressing uh disaster that's in a way the most visible for all of us yeah, and but let let me yeah. first tell you, uh, like the philosophy of my book, mm. is that I wanted to do a tour in what I call the uh, live the living memorials of the war. Mm. Mm. Uh, so, and for me, those are for my generation. We have two Beiruts. We have Beirut, the ruins of downtown Beirut. Yeah, and we have the uh, the reconstruction of Beirut. For my parents, there are three Beiruts. Mm. There is Beirut, Swiss, Russia, and uh, Switzerland, and Paris of the East, and you know, the golden yep. era Beirut, mm. the golden age Beirut. And there is the war, and there is the reconstruction. 90s reconstruction post. Yeah. So I know those two Beiruts, and those two Beiruts have always been like the before and after Lebanon shot twice yes. concept. So for right. us, that was our narrative. Mm. The mm. war, the the phoenix yeah right and then suddenly with age <laughs> and with <laughs> with generations yeah coming in i felt that there's a new beirut emerging mm, mm. and that beirut is a kind of zaytuna bay the tall buildings of Il manara yeah because they represent a culture those are the back office of dubai this is the the mini dubai yeah. feel of beirut yeah. And and this small Beirut uh, extends to Zay, uh, to like it's Zaytuna Bay from one side, and then you have Jemaizi and Maram Khail on the other side. So this has mm, become mm. a culture, the new culture of Beirut. So that's the third Beirut that I've witnessed, and I saw it emerging. And and for me, I don't have place in that Beirut. I'm still the person who goes to Mono who goes to Hamra, <laughs> yeah. and not to Jemaizi and Maram Khail. I'm yeah. too old for Jemaizi and Maram Khail. So I felt that so on the demarcation line of this emerging Beirut, there is in the middle of Beirut, there is also what I called the Great Wall of Beirut. It's like the Great Wall of China. <laughs> there is this Great Wall of Beirut that is 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 a beast. And like Burj Al Mar 
in the middle yes. of the city. You know, it's a beast that reminds the the city and the capital of Lebanon that there's something wrong. You actually honor something. You you own something, which I think is not easy to do. You refer to it as ruin porn. Yes. But it's not something that's necessarily bad in that it's everywhere in the city and it takes a storyteller to actually unlayer these different emotions and different tragedies. And I think the, the, the benefit of this book really is that even when you're trying to show something which is obviously very new and very solidair oriented, it's actually a photo but taken also from this is, But this is also not even solidair oriented. It's... It's post solidarity. It's post solidarity, but also even a photo like this is from British Mail, yes, which I think exactly. that that's quite smart. That and you're this showing. is why, uh, yeah, when you zoom out, you see British Mail. So let's go. Let's go through these stops as much as we can, one by one. Let's talk about first the most difficult one, which is the one that we've both been yeah. m- maybe scarred by the most in recent years. May I ask why you decided to choose the port blast or the silos, the most significant emblem? of the port blast why you start here is it to remind us that this is our time right now and to own it and dive deep or is it really just a something that hits you hardest in this book because for me no matter how many times i've seen this photo or looked at the port uh i i am still uncomfortable with this chapter yes. we, we looking at it we... and yeah We are all uncomfortable so, with so this. So why is this the first one? If I, if I may ask you, your, your decision to put this as number one. We started, like the book initially started from St. George. Mm. And it was 10 stops from, from St. George to uh, the museum, National oh, Museum. Okay. So yeah. that was the path. Yes. You know, just the green line. Yes, right. The so Great really Wall of Beirut. The Great yeah. Wall of, yeah. And then the blast happens. Mm. You know, lots of people tell the story of Beirut through uh, through Saint George and yeah. what it represents. And it is a stop in the book. Yeah. But you wanted to. So now, yeah. with for for the in the new history of Beirut, there is a new stop, a moment, mm. a, 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 a turning point, which is the Beirut blast, and it was a huge turning point for for like for three, four generations of people living in Lebanon and in Beirut. Like it was a moment where lots of people really lost hope. Yeah. We always had hope that things will become better, that there is someone who will, who will save the whole situation, someone who can do a happy ending. And then with this unexpected blast, People lost hope. I borrowed photos from different photographers because there are some photos that are iconic for me and I wanted mm. to have mm. them in my collection. Yeah. So almost like 30 photographers, I, I, I've got their uh, their photos and they were kind enough to give me the copyright. Mm. Uh, I saw just Patrick Bez yeah. is in there and other famous no, the, photographers. Yeah, are, yeah. yeah. The Patrick Bez is, is for France Press, I think. So it's, oh, it's a different okay. story. So I no, yeah. no, I'm talking here with amateur photographers mm-hmm. or with uh, professional photographers who own the photos. I see. It's, it's their photos. Mm. And for me, this is like the iconic photo. Like when I close my eyes, I want... And I think of, let's say, Burj Al Mar. So there's one shot that comes to my mind. Mm. I could have gone there and and I could have taken this shot. Yeah. But I wanted to to give credit to the people who yes. made those iconic photos. So I've I've let, let's say 30 photographers who yeah. were kind enough to give me their photos. And then when the book was published, published, I I tried to call them to give them like the book. And more than like 75% of those people were not in Lebanon anymore. Oh they, had, they just left. That's, that's in the last three years. They lost hope. Wow. And the whole story of Lebanon <sighs> is based on hope. Yeah. This section of the book, it's... I, I want to point out, it's not just photos. There's a valuable text in the book. And there's a movement for hope even in Lebanon. There's a, that's true. That's something else, maybe. But let's. Uh, I, the, I surprised myself. I, I just. <laughs> I, I kind of saw the. I saw where that was going. The, that was a joke. Yeah, I, I know. <laughs> I believe me. I know. There's there's a rich text in this in this book, and I'll I'll just say from my side, you're able to navigate all three: the golden age, civil war, 
and post-war reconstruction, not just in photos but in very easy to access text, you reminded me that the silos survived during the war, that they were still in operation despite a rocket that hit them, yes. and despite new silos at some point collapsing post-war, they were functioning the whole time. I did not know that. And also that uh, the inception where it came from, the funding, I, there's a lot of details that I didn't know. A Palestinian architect, it's Kuwaiti two years, funds. It's two years of research. And it, it's actually very easy to read and yes. enjoy. Now, this is what I liked about the book as much as the photos. So there's a tour. It's a tour, but you know, in addition to both the photos and the text, I think it's actually designed just right mm. so that you can flip through and it's it's pleasurable. There's and the design, it's a statement. It's a very bold design. Mm. And we had like lots of uh, lots of uh, disputes and discussions. Or let me say, we had like huge discussions with the publishers about mm. the design mm. and how we should. So I, I wanted a very bold design with a statement design, I call it. Well, I think you even start off with a very bold image of a statue that all of us know but don't know as well. You got details that I would have never noticed. Yeah, we, we used the drone for this because we mm -hmm. always see this uh, monument, uh, the Martyrs yeah. uh, Square, at the Martyrs Square, from down. So we right. always, always see the face. This is almost like a drone image. Yeah, it's it. a drone image. Okay, we'll save that when it, when it happens on the, on the tour that we're going through. You jump from the port to one of the most historic buildings in the city. Mm. I did not know the backstory of Lorient. I did not know. Now it's, you know. And I didn't know that there was a confusion, actually, over the original owners or yeah. even the... Uh, because this is one of the oldest buildings and it still has the Ottoman, French... Mm, mm. It started like the owners, I think, were... Uh, it, the whole concept of the building... Uh, and the design started during the Ottoman era. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. that's why it's one of the oldest buildings and the design is very original because it was this transition between the French colonial style and the Ottoman Mediterranean. And even its, its importance for what press used to be in this part of the world. Beirut was a hub for printing press. And here you have an outlet that later becomes Lorient Le Jour, when it joins Le Jour. These are stories I forgot. And they're very easy to access here. And I really, you know, I enjoyed also that you're able to remind me of my generation. I remember going through downtown as a kid. And seeing it this way. Seeing it right before it became this way. And then by the time I'm 16, 17, this is what it looks like. And this is, a, I, I think, erased. like... Our generation saw this transformation in Beirut, yeah. and uh, we have different views, like, you have very uh, different views about it, whether with or against. Mm -hmm. uh, for me, and this is like one of the big ideas I wanted to, to put on the table in this book, is that I, all, like, Solidaire is Beirut, yeah. and the ruined Beirut is Beirut. Yeah. And then today's Beirut is Beirut. Mm -hmm. And the golden era Beirut is Beirut. None of those Beiruts are fake. Those are all part of Beirut's identity. You have to live with that. Mm. You have to love them all. You cannot be with one part or one chunk of, you, of your capital's history. Mm. This is the evolution of the city. You have to respect it. You mm. have to live with it. And you have to move on to build a better city. So there's no opinion. It's really there is opinion. That's mm. my opinion. Oh, I mean, sorry. Let me rephrase I that. Want, I You're not want saying what is better or what is worse. No, You're saying this is how it is. I want the Lebanese to reconcile with their city, to love their city in its ups and downs. And you cannot erase, like, 20 years of, of your city's life as if it didn't happen, or 30 years, whether it was war, whether it was the reconstruction process, whether whether it was like the golden era, you cannot erase. They, those come and build on each other. It's a build up. There's a build up, but you also very through a lot of detail, you show us exactly that sometimes it's really just a thin facade of what's left. 
It and was an architectural decision. Yeah, but they wanted a bigger interior. So. Yeah, but no. I caught that because this was during Corona, and no one knew that this is happening. Right, right. So you, I noticed recently that it's completely gutted. Yes. But these are the photos that I actually... I ha- captured the moment and it was all, yeah. Yeah, these are... This is the interior. This is right. what used to be the in the interior of mm-hmm. the building. And then during Corona, it was all removed. And yep. this was like an architectural decision. Yeah. But you've preserved it. And that's very, yes. very recent. I've caught the moment and it was all by chance. I'd like to jump to the story that I think has plagued us. It's... One man's dispute <laughs> against a company, and people took sides, uh, and I think that has unfortunately. And people used like some political parties used. Sure, but there's a very rich history to the Saint George, yes. and you explored that too. You know, the original design. I did not know when I was going through the book. I did not know that this is what it used to look like from the 1920s. I did not know the Shah of Iran. Uh, Reza Pahlavi, is that right? Brigitte Bardot, I knew about because I think everyone knows Brigitte yeah. Bardot has been there. But the the kind of there was no other VIP, let's say, uh, hotel or whatever you want to call it. This was the only one. Yeah, in the late twenties, thirties. So it was the hotel, the, the Phoenicia of Lebanon. Right. Yes, before the Phoenicia. Yeah. yeah. But you very quickly show us that, I mean, this building was not big enough and suddenly it's an expanded boutique hotel and it defined the golden era. Yes. I have absolutely no relationship to the St. George other than its current state. Do you find more depth in the St. George? No, because also my parents were not like the clientele of St. George. Mm, mm, mm. Uh, so, and St. George was more linked to the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s Beirut, yeah. the pre Gulf boom. Right. So, it was more the Mediterranean slash Christian mm, slash mm. Phoenician face of Beirut. It was. It, uh, the St. George opened Beirut to the Mediterranean, mm. while Phoenicia and Holiday Inn opened Beirut to the Gulf because it was Gulf right. money, yeah. Gulf economic uh, uh, boom, mm. The, mm. the whole thing. So those, those are like the two touristic landmarks. One right. was towards Europe and one was towards the Gulf. So you find it also there's a disconnect in your own life to this hotel too. No, no, I, I, like I'm, I'm not. Those are like touristic uh, destinations. I'm not a tourist in my country. No. Those are like this is one of the problems of Lebanon. You identify your whole country with an hotel, with a singer, with a play, with a man. Mm. It's not about this. This is why we are here today. Which countries are not built on a famous hotel or a famous singer? Countries are built on values, on common identities. And hotels don't make identity. Hotels are made for tourists. I guess I'm asking it the wrong way because St. George to me, even when... It's an hotel for tourists. It doesn't identify us as a country. But I'll say this from my side. Even in its current... It's a very orientalistic way to look at Lebanon. No, no, no. We are not an hotel. We are a country. I, I, this sorry. is made for I'm tourists. I'm sorry, sorry. I'm not. Uh, I'm not phrasing this the right way. I find this s- is one of the strongest photos for me. Okay, l- let me let me try to do this without it. Uh, I'll try to make sure it makes sense. Okay. Even though the Saint George has experienced civil war history, violent history, even though the facade was destroyed with Rafi Hadidi's assassination. Even though the current owner, Fuad Khouri, we all know him from that Stop Solidaire sign and his problems with Solidaire, even though it has that history, which is new, and it's not always positive, actually, mostly not, uh, I still find meaning in the Holiday Inn. The yes. St. George means nothing to me. The Holiday Inn means everything. And I don't know why. 
I can think about the Holiday Inn for hours on end, I get bored with the same George. And I'm curious if you feel the same way. Even though they're from the same, the <laughs> same, they're the same story yeah. in that they're pre-war. They're gutted during the war. They're they're not gutted. They're uh, holiday they're the worst. is more majestic, of course. It's more, uh, it's more majestic. It's more uh, closed. You don't know what's inside. Mm. It's stuck in history and mm. in time. It's it's stuck in place, out of place, out of time, out of everything. On the tour, just I used to call it the green line stuck in time. Yeah, just stuck there. And also don't forget that the whole Lebanon war and the terms of Sharia, Gharbiya, East Beirut, West Beirut, it tri- like the, the point, the big band point was Holiday Inn. So, so it's yeah. West Beirut, East Beirut. Mm. The reference was Holiday Inn. So do you think it's... Really, that and also no one today. I don't know if like people know. No one owns Holiday Inn. I understood that it was up for sale at some point, and no one took it. But no one right? owns it. No, no one owns it. No so one even owns the Saint Charles uh, whatever company. It, yeah, the company like it was. It finished in in 1980, let's say. Oh, and then okay. the 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 owners didn't do like the, this this company. I don't know the legal procedure, mm-hmm. but they should have like renewed. The company, yes, right, and no one renewed it, and now no one's own, no one owns it. You use the word majestic, that is a word to describe the holiday. And I love that you put the few photos available yes. of those eighteen months or so that it was operational. I've never seen the holiday in at this angle. I did not know the holiday in had the sign. Did not have this. I know. I remembered the sign at the top of the building. Yes. I did not know this existed. I knew that the name of the cinema was St. Charles. I didn't know the company that owned the property. So it's all like, you, 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 it's always like surprises. The book is full of surprises. The book is full of details that I did not know yeah. until you mentioned them. And it's, it's great. I can spend hours with this book, but I did spend... Coming from you, I'm so happy now with the book. Oh, Zaven, I mean, look... I haven't felt this happy. There's a lot of things that I know, and then there's some things that I would have never known had you not written them and explained them. Because so. also I'm correcting lots of viral information on online, uh, like in platforms, websites, uh, on social media, like totally fake news. Let me tell you a story. So my book, I'm trying also to... You know, one of like my biggest challenges is to know who this person was. Well, I And mean, I found him. Really? You found him. Yeah, but I didn't take like he, he he didn't want his name to be mentioned, so I just put the initials. I did not notice that. It's full of surprises. See, I told th- you. This is it's a famous the best photo. Gift. Uh, it's the best <laughs> gift on Christmas. <laughs> okay. This is the marketing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it'll be it'll be plugged in the episode. Links accessible. <laughs> Go to Antoine. Th- thank you. I, I have to thank Ashet Antoine, my publishers. They still believe that you can do books in Beirut. Well, I think that's huge. They're the they're the pioneers still. Yeah, right? that's huge. I I want to tell you a story, Zepan. Yes. This is the holiday, and we both don't know, right? My parents had a date, like many couples did. And actually, on Facebook, whenever I post photos of the Holiday Inn, there's these weird comments that pop up. They're usually people that have been inside 40, 50 years ago. And they mention that, oh yeah, they were there right before the war broke out. This happens often. My parents, one of those couples, they went to the rotating restaurant at the top and that bar at night. I did not know that it was called Pinnacle Le Pinacle. I did not know the nightclub was called Sanglo. I did not know this existed. And I really was overwhelmed when I saw this. So I really, you, you brought the holiday into life. And when I was younger, perhaps uh, dumber, and younger meaning uh, maybe 15 years ago, right when the Syrian army withdrew and before the Lebanese army went Took in, over, yeah. there was a guy at the bottom of the Holiday Inn with a TV and a blanket 
That was the security for the whole damn holiday inn. And at night, he would lie down on the blanket, on the, on the, on the mattress, watch some series on MTV. Or Future TV. Or Future, probably he was watching you. <laughs> and the man would fall asleep. This would happen every night. And it took me a few times to realize there's no one else there. It's just him. So I was foolish, but I did it. I snuck into the Holiday Inn. And I went up the stairwell on the side of the building. It's not a very easy journey. It's dangerous. So it was not cleaned yet at that time. It was clean from the Civil War. Yeah. But it was... Okay. Uh, not from the Syrian uh, troops. It was clean post-Syria. Okay. Yeah. But it was not... Um, I mean, you know, this building is so haunting, yeah. even when it's cleaned. Yeah, of but course. But it it's risky. It's dangerous. I've been also into that. You've been into yeah. Okay. So wait. I, hold I, on. I, yeah. let, let me tell you first, and then I want to get it to you. I reached the middle, and I didn't notice that there's actually a gap in the middle of the holiday, and it's two buildings built yeah, side yeah, by side. Of this is dangerous if you're walking at night. I had a Nokia flashlight looking, trying to find where the floor is. Stupid, but I made it to the restaurant at the top, and I felt that this is probably the most this is the scariest experience I will ever live is the bats, the trees, the tiles that were still there, the wind it was so damn scary to be up there, and also thinking that somebody could run up and kill me. one of the most thrilling experiences of my life. So you tell me your your trip into the holiday. Inn. Well, I didn't make it to the top. I only, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I only climbed first or second floor. <laughs> and this is the story of my life. I said, well, I cannot continue this without my camera and my team. Hmm. So I went back home and I said, well, I'll go another day. And when I went with my team another day, I was not permitted in. Did you go in the first time it was, uh, I think it was also in this gap period mm, between mm. the Syrian uh, withdrawal and before the Lebanese uh, army took over the place. Somebody saw you going in and then they Yeah, said they, they said, I cannot go in. Yeah. So I, I thought that I, I should have gone alone with the candid camera thing. Yeah. I, I'm so happy I went in. Yeah. But it's a stupid move to do on your own at night. Yeah, I know. It, and even the stairwell, there's holes. You can actually yeah, slip yeah, out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, also, on the first, uh, first like, two floors, yeah. it's the same thing. Um, but the, the thing, like, it's... I call the book Guilty Pleasures because I've seen lots of tourists, especially Japanese, European tourists, stopping in mm. front of Holiday Inn and taking this photo. Yeah. And for me, this is uh, like ruined porn. Yeah. And like porn, you always end up with guilty pleasure. <laughs> so, <laughs> but I mean, there's, you use also the word majestic. I've never heard that word. Like, for the look holiday. this. I love this photo because we took this from the Phoenicia, twenty-first floor of Phoenicia, and this is it's like the background. Okay. Yeah. 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 Uh, so this is for me. It's also one of the great walls of Beirut. And this wall is just in the heart of Beirut, hindering the, 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 like the healthy evolution of the city. The city is still stuck. Those buildings are so majestic, so big, so, so, so strange that they hinder the, 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 the normal, healthy evolution of the city. A city cannot build the future based on ruins. And those don't, don't represent values, don't mm. represent identities. Those are hotels. Mm. But there's um, something in there that is no longer there, but you feel it. You know, I, I do remember stories of how bad things got at the Holiday Inn. Um, I did go down as well, and you can go to where the Syrians used to live yeah. in the Holiday Inn. And you see things there. And you don't really know. It's if a different that's, world. It's no, no. no um, you feel like there could have been torture done yes, in the course. holiday. And the same thing in Burj Al Mar. Also, you have that yes. feeling. But also, there's a lot of engravings in the Holiday Inn that were not removed. So even in the walls, 
you will still see engravings because yeah. they're in the wall. I did not know, and you wrote this in the book, I did not know that 300 tons of war damage was removed from the Holiday Inn. And is that, did I get that right? That it's something yes. like 300 tons and skeletons were yes. still in there. I, I didn't know that after the war that there was still... Skeletons, yeah. Because like, it's... It's how many floors? 30 uh, something. something like 20 something, yeah. 30 floors. Yeah. No one like thought of let's search for the skeletons in the building. It's a sad story. Sad or dead. Very sad. I I find a lot of meaning in it though. Not yeah. necessarily positive meaning. And the thing, like one of the things also, I don't know the elevator story. Have you read it? I read this in the book. I didn't believe it. No, the, it is true. The because they had kept running? Yeah, because this was like the fastest elevator in the Middle East yeah. back then. Yeah. So like 28 floors in like five seconds something. Yeah, yeah. So this was a big state, like it was a technological innovation at the time. So they had special generator or, or whatever UPS something. Mm. So when, when the whole electricity went, uh, went down and the whole city collapsed and the whole hotel collapsed, the generator of the elevator remained working. But h how does that remain working? I, that took yeah, because it's like it's like the, the because you have like peop like the militia people who were there. Oh, uh, they were operating it. No, no, it, it operated on its own. So they were like for them, it was like, what's this? It was like a spaceship. <laughs> That's crazy. Come think of it like the, the the whole city is in dark and suddenly you have this box coming up and down and the militia, uh, the militias there uh, enjoying the ride. It was like the fastest elevator in the Middle East and the fastest deterioration of a city falling apart. It adds to the haunting element to this building. Everything is wrong. In the and this one, this is one of the angles of Holiday Inn that no one knows. This is the triangle building downstairs. No, right? this is huh? the, the this is the mall part, not the triangle building. The mall part, which you can only see from uh, oh, of from the, on the back yeah. on on the back side. Every year they do the expo underneath. This. Yeah, 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 right. Because lots of people told me this is this can no way this can be in the holiday and it's in the holiday and, and this is inside. Like the nice thing about the book is you go inside yeah. those buildings to see what's inside. I've never been inside this section of the holiday and I didn't know it even. Uh, it's not. I would have never imagined this is what it looks like, but the building, like you said, it's stuck in time. And, and also you have how like different Jad al Khuri, Jad al -Khuri one of my yeah, favorite of guests on the podcast and he's not in Lebanon he's also he's one of the North. guys yeah. yes I love this guy I met him during the protests painting on the egg he was throwing paint off of yeah. the egg and I asked him if we could do an episode he told me he didn't do just this he did Burj al Hawa we're going to get yes. into the curtains of the of Burj al Mur but he told me he did these little designs I did not know it was him, and some of them you can still see. They're yes, not yeah, all it's the traces. Yes, yeah, of course. but Zaven, is it true that they were removed? No, I don't think no no one bothered to remove anything. Oh, so okay. it's just fading. Yeah, and this is also artwork related to different generations seeing the Holiday Inn story from different perspectives. Yeah. So also, I wanted to see those landmarks from different. Uh, like different viewpoints, different generations, different feels about them. So you have uh, the stories at different times and the story of those places through the eyes of different generations. I feel uh, very unlucky that I have never seen the Holiday Inn the way it was meant to look. And all, all I know is the Holiday Inn either occupied or left in a mess. And my first uh, visit to Beirut, I remember the holiday. Inn. But you are the f among the very few person who have been in this uh, rotating uh, hotel. Yeah. You were lucky. Very lucky. And also this, the like I this took rotating. Piece, I took a piece of the tile with me. And this rotating hotel, you know, it's part of the Lebanese pop culture because of Ziad Rahbani's play. Yes, right. Benesvela Bukrashu. Exactly.
And is it the, it just keeps turning around? Yeah. How many times does it turn? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because it's very symbolic. It was, it was the face of the 1970s Beirut, mm -hmm. which is like the Beirut that has no boundaries, the Beirut that has no limits, the Beirut that like, that was like the golden, it's, it's the face of the golden age of Beirut. And that, gold, that moment, I, I guess, uh, led to the civil war. Yeah, those 18 months that it operated is the free Like fall. the whole, this, the, the, this whole, uh, the, like what was happening in Beirut was a little bit fake also. Like this whole golden era is like, like you said, you talked about the press, also the Lebanese, like golden, golden era of press. Also, it's fake. It's not, mm. it's not money generated from the readers. Mm. The whole, uh, like the whole, how do I say? I like the, I the, 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 it's not fake, Seven. I don't know if it's fake. It's more that maybe it wasn't as golden no, as no. we. The, the, you should have a business model. A newspaper should have its money from readers or advertisers, mm -hmm. not from foreign. Uh, and uh, foreign, it's, it shouldn't be foreign money. If it's foreign money, it's fake. Well, let's look at what Lebanese money did with Burj Al Mur, Michel Mur's accidental, flawed <laughs> skyscraper, <laughs> Holiday Inn's ugly kid brother. You know, this <laughs> <laughs> the fact that they're close to each other. Listen, I call it the monster. You call it the monster, but I, I've never been intimidated by Burj Al Mur, even though snipers lived here. And you know what? You, you said something which I remembered. Burj Al Ghazal being built in a way that it would not get hit. By the sniper, for, to protect the glass. Right. Or even architects in Ashrafi yeah. thinking twice before they build a certain direction. Sniper's den. But the fact that it was never finished and the fact that it's not very impressive architecturally. I always thought of it as the less impressive holiday in story, the less majestic, the tower that's no longer a tower. There's now taller buildings than the Buddhist remote. But also it was an, a style in architecture. It was yeah. the fashion mm -hmm. then, mm -hmm. you know, it was the offices culture, the small, they call it like the, the, the cube, the cubic, uh, offices yeah so it was the culture of the 70s to have like those long uh, New York style uh, buildings yeah. and uh, but it was a statement by Michel Elmer then he wanted to build the tallest building in the Middle East and his challenge was he wanted to do one floor like one floor every day that was the uh, mixed cement, is that right? Yeah. That he was able yeah. to do this in yeah. 30 Also, days? it was like new for, for the city. Yeah. It was not used for the first time, but it was for the first time that uh, under media coverage and mm. that mm. that exposed. And the problem with Belgium Malia, like this led to lots of mistakes in the building. Oh, th that's where the mistakes come from. Yes. Oh, I didn't know that. Because okay. they wanted to do it like fastest ever mm -hmm. growing... Uh, building I, I so you have mistakes it's uh, like even back then if it was to finish they would have con like they would have discovered those mistakes and right. uh, so it would have had to be brought down anyway then let me ask you then all this talk about unesco at some point thinking about going in and then solely there thinking about knocking it down but that it just becomes about money at the end that it's too expensive to tear it down and it's left this way that to me symbolizes a lot of things that are wrong today. That you have prime real estate that a company sees as, meh, we'll just leave it alone for now. And it really reminds us all of a civil war. It's yes, almost like yes, of course. Yeah, almost. of course. But the thing is that you can, it's, it's, an, it's a building good for nothing. This is how it's called <laughs> in the architecture world. That's interesting. It's called a building, like a structure good for nothing. You cannot wow. keep it, you cannot operate it, you cannot fix it, you cannot yeah. tore it down. And if you tore it down, the, the, the property itself, it's too small to have any investment in it. Right, and when right. Solidaire went, 
the like the it's for it's it's put for sale now and no mm. one no one is interested to do anything with it. There was a time Michel Mur wanted Took it, it back. back. Yes, yeah, he, right, he, yeah. he got it back yeah. because at one point like at its peak, Solidaire at its peak where like with all those stories like uh, UNESCO is going to be in there. Yeah. Want, yeah. So he wanted the building back, and mm. then he he made huge political pressure. Like the mm. whole country was like uh, about to like, if you know, it was everything. Like there was, I, I think, political scandals, political lockdown in the city, only because he wants to get his building back. Yeah. And then he got his building back, and he saw I cannot, I can do nothing with this building, and then he let go of it again. So now it's owned technically by Solidaire. By Solidaire, and it's for sale, and no one is interested to get it. So I guess that means you still have to knock it down. The property is yes. for sale, but the building is unusable. Yes. This is where it becomes very disappointing that a friend of ours, Jad al Khouri, was not able to keep something that he was doing longer than a few days, which is Burj al Hawa. I loved that moment driving by. Yes on the ring and going into Hamra, seeing these curtains flapping. And then two or three days later, they're all gone. That also to me was a moment of, we could leave this as it is. And Solidaire says, no, let's remove it. I, I felt very bad for Jad after that happened. And I can only imagine how much time it took for him to put all of these curtains. Yeah. And it actually made the, cur- made the building pleasant. These colors yes, yes, I, the uh, of course, I'm with Jad, but also Jad was not allowed to do holes. Mm. He should have done everything that mm. you know. He mm. should have not intervened. <laughs> and hmm. but that's not why they removed it. It's more that they just didn't want. Oh, it was. Any. I think I talked with Jad about this. It was supposed to be for one month, and then there was this dispute. They they found that that uh, you know, he he had made holes yeah. in the walls, yeah, yeah, yeah. and he was not supposed to do that. It's an artwork. It's a moment. It's a photography moment, and yeah. we have the photos. I I wish it stayed. This is this is uh, personally. I yeah. th- I think uh, we could do better than just having a slab of cement, uh, which is very. The fact that you can't do anything with it. You know, one of my, one of the pages I like about this book, it's this. Show me. This is like one of my favorite oh, pages. Yeah. This is where it's Syrian. It's the writings yeah. on the on the wall. Yeah. And one of the other great things about this book is that you always discover new things, and this is something you will discover now. Oh. Read. Where? Here. Oh, sorry. Life is a Traitor, Abu Ammar, Syria, Hasba. Yeah. So this is like, yeah. th- this is, uh, this is the writings on the w- inside walls of the building. So first you see the Palestinian yeah. uh, walls yeah. era, yeah. and then you see the Syrians, right. and then you see Hezbollah, and then you see Ghaddari Zaman. <laughs> wow. It will all pass. And That's the monster will wow. remain standing. That's impressive, Zavan. In the middle of the city. Well, I never, I never, I never caught that. These are all. Uh, they're all. It's a journey that speaks for itself in the building. Did you take these photos? Were you? Uh, no, those were Jad took them. Jad took them. But I, I did the story. Like I, I connected the photos together. Wow. I'm a big fan of Jad al Khouri. I'm glad you're able to celebrate not just his wind display, but uh, good for him that he was able to document this. Because I think this reflects the whole story of Beirut. And then you have love and Feirouz. Feirouz is, uh, you know, I've seen so her. Yeah. She's always shot at in these buildings. <laughs> 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 so, so do you imagine like someone, a militia person, drawing pharaohs on the wall? No. But then again, fifteen years of all char- all types of characters, yeah, shooting from there, yeah. and dying. This is a building, the Grand Theater. We're halfway through the book, the Grand Theater, which I only discovered. 
intimately during October 17th. Yeah. When we kind of found ourselves able to get in. Uh, the story of its decline was actually quite interesting. You reminded me that this was not a upscale sort of uh, hip theater or even a modest uh, cinema. It was a porn theater towards the 1960s, 50s, 60s, yeah. But before it was yeah. like in the late 20s, 30s, it was the yeah. in place. The in place. That yeah. Gone with the Wind was shown here? Yeah. Or and what? then yeah. like, like, every, like, like the evolution of the city, you have like places go... And the, like today, like Mono, we have lived mm, Mono. Mm. We've seen the peak of Mono, and then we saw Mono almost closing down. Yeah. Jamaisi, Marm Khair. So you have always those heights. Uh, there is an evolution for the city, and it's normal. It's uh, it's just normal. It's cities. You, no one can explain how cities evolve. But we can always explain the brilliance of Yusuf Aftimos, who's... Yeah, of course. I mean, it's one of his best accomplishments. And El Baladi, in addition to another stop, Beit Beirut, Bereket building, we'll get into that. But the architecture is quite impressive, this layered architecture. Yeah, of course. And I like that it comes at the turn of the century, so it's embracing Ottoman, French, and more modern influences. But when I went inside, all I could look at was the remnants of the mosaic at yeah. the top. And I think there's a photo of that here. If memory serves me right. I saw one photo of it here. Oh, that's, yeah, this is the theater. You know, but there the whole, yeah. Yeah, that's still there. Yes. Yeah, that was incredible to witness during the protest. Yes, I, I can Did I you can go imagine. in as well? Yeah, yeah, of course. That yeah. Like, uh, some of the photos, I, I took them oh, with my yours. photographer. Okay. And some of them, no, I took them with uh, someone, like, it's credited. But I took this whole, like, this whole building is part of my journey, not because of the architecture, not because of uh, the, the ceiling, not be only because, not because of Charles Aznavour. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, it will be... <laughs> well, I thought it was because, an homage to Because of this... Oh, the landmines, right, right. Because there was a sign... I saw this sign mm. in, in 2004. It was still standing there. It was a, wow. a, a sign uh, in, in the grass. Yeah. You know, there was those growing grass in the backyard of the, of the building. And I don't know why I was there. And I saw the sign and I was like interested to know what's inside the sign. Because I, I, maybe I was like, we were shooting some, something there. And, you know, it came to my, to my, like, I saw it and I wanted to know what's on this sign because I felt it's a very yeah. old sign. And I went inside and it was like, uh, and for me, like this sign to, it was like in 2004 when Solidaire and downtown Beirut were on their peak. And there is this sign that stands out, Al Ghamm. So, so, I, so at that time, I could, like there, I, I didn't know what to do with, with like, it meant nothing except for, well, it's it's so strange to have this sign still. This sign, like, survived Solidaire. Yeah. <laughs> it's uh, al -Ghan. And then, uh, 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 so for me, the whole, the story of this building was through the sign. So, uh, I and I included it because of the sign. And when I went, like, 15 years later, during the Saura or whenever I, I started shooting it, it was still there. You're joking. The sign. That sign was still there. Really? Yeah. Oh, wow. So this is not from 15 years no, ago. No, 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 no. This is oh. like all new. Is it? Do you know if it's still there today? Every time I pass from there, I check if it's still there. Last time I was there, it was still there. Oh, my God. And what, like, oh my why God. I check it? Because I want to take it home. <laughs> well do that before Sunday when this episode <laughs> comes out because I might actually see because you every time I'm there I just like you know I start like planning where should I put my car where sh from where should I because now it's all closed it's not open anymore so, you, right. so I have to jump oh, the God. wall yeah and take it and come down and I don't want to do it with someone you I want to do it alone jump into the courtyard and then yeah. into the courtyard and take it in my car and run. That's not easy to take. You're I, gonna know. I think you'll have to get equipment to yank it out. 
Uh, if I see you on the news, I know what I know <laughs> why you're there. Uh, I I didn't know it's still there. Yeah, it's still there. Uh, now and now I'm intrigued to check again. I think both of us are going to find yeah. each other at two in the morning. <laughs> Th- there's something you talk about though, which is also missing from our life, our generation, is the cinema culture of downtown, yeah. of Hamra, and the cinemas that once really dotted the city are are gone. So even that's over. But I only got to really experience this during October 17 for a few weeks. Now it's locked up again. And I'm really glad I was there right then to see something that may have already been on the decline, but once, a hundred years ago or so, was really a statement in Beirut. And this sort of real culture in downtown Beirut, that's just gone. And all that's left is a sign that you're referring to, which is not about culture, it's about death, landmines. So I'm glad you included that. I'd like to jump from the Grand Theater to the most important part of the city for me. Not because of the statue itself, but because I find a lot of personal meaning in this part of Beirut. The statue means, I think, many things to different people, depending on how they feel at certain times in their their history. Um, I see it as triumph and despair. And I know that this is... A statue that has withstood not just civil war, but it has withstood politics. At some point, it's dislodged. It's difficult to bring it back. It's eventually brought back. The best decision is to keep its scars as it exists. You explained the statue in a way that made sense. I never knew that it's four different stories in one. I always thought it was martyrs below and then liberty at the top and liberty embracing a martyr. But the way you described it makes sense. It's four stages, if you will, and four different types. Well, this is how this is how, <laughs> how uh, the, 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 the architect, design, yeah, yeah. The architect himself and explained it. But for me, like I had Kurati, is that yeah, uh, yeah. an Italian yeah. uh, architect uh, and sculptor. Uh, but for me, what I wanted, like it's here because also it's one of the walls of Beirut because of the scars. And this was one of the biggest decisions at the time. Do we keep it or do we fix it? Mm-hmm. It's good that they kept it, as you said. But we, we this is the this is the the lady of Beirut. Let's say this is the the face of Beirut, and no one has seen the face of Beirut. It's his friend's daughter. Did you mention that in the? Yeah, yeah. The, the the this guy. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yes. But this is like <laughs> this. This represents Beirut, mm. and no one has seen the face because it's. So high, you cannot see. You see it from the cheeks oh, up. Oh, I see. So yeah. this is why I use the drone for the Lebanese to see the face mm. of mm. Mm. of the lady of the square. I'm really glad you did that. I like you. And said. you see the features. It's so so strange to look at her, as if sh- you know. It's so strange the features. Don't recognize her. I only recognize her. Yeah, but me. but you feel that you know her. You know her. I nah, know. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I know her well. I also know that the weeping woman that once stood in Martyr's Square, that we're not supposed to look at them directly. They're supposed to be elevated, but we can see them in Surso because it's now at human scale. I guess they're, they're supposed to be as sort of distant as she is, but we know, we know them up close now. I'm glad you were able to bring, bring her to scale. Yeah. And also the other, my other like uh, concern or my other question was, where is the missing hand? Yeah, that to me, Zevin, I did not know. I had no idea. That whole story Because I always thought, incredible. where is this hand? Who owns this hand? May I ask how, how you found out about that? Research, question. Who, who did asking, you ask? Asking the, I asked them for the person who fixed. <laughs> Very simple. The, the person who fixed it. So you were able to find the person who fixed it. Yeah. And you asked him, where's the hand? And he said, oh, there's somebody who found the hand and gave it to the Beledi. No, it's not this. So he also the, the man who was fixing it at the Catholic University. Oh, he kept it. Sorry. No, no. So yeah, it, yeah. they were fixing it and mm. there was this hand. Also, they faced questions like, do we build a new hand? Right. Do we complete right. it? Do we not complete it? Do we close the... 
the, the scars or not. So they decided to keep it as is. And then he was doing a, a radio interview and he said during the interview, there is a missing hand. Who has the hand? <laughs> And like weeks after, someone called, I have the hand. Oh, this I, was really? Yeah, oh. it was real. So wow. so someone called back after a while, yeah. out of the blue, and he says, I, I've, I've, I've seen the hand uh, at one point, oh. and I've, I took it home. <laughs> and if you want it, you can have it. And he, I, 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 I remember he told me, the man told him, I always felt that someone, someday someone would ask for this hand, so I kept it. That's incredible. Because it was just in, the, in this bailey. You found... So when, when they've yeah. got the hand, also they had now to decide, do we uh, put it back? Mm, mm. What do we do with the hand? Yeah. Yeah. So they decided to put it in the baladi. I did not know that this whole... I did not know, first of all, that the hand was discovered, that the hand is still visible in, inside the municipality. You so if you it. were Adho Majlis Baladi, hey, you is. would be doing your meeting. <laughs> I'll, I'll put money on this. They don't know what this is. They don't. They yeah. don't. And this is not a uh, family belonging. It's a national That you put thing. this in the book, I know it means something to you. And I'm glad you did this because you, it's almost like a piece of a puzzle yeah. that you found. And you're like, I want to put this here and show everyone the hand is doing just fine. Yeah. Post-Syria, it has become the defining yeah. location. Be before before uh, 2005, the, the monument itself meant nothing. Mm -hmm. yeah. It stood for nothing. Yeah. With, after 2005, it became part of Beirut. Returned right in time, 2004, it is brought back. And you actually have a photo of its yeah. return, which was quite nice as well. The architect, here it is, yeah, uh, redesigning the location. Uh, I remember this. I remember the first two years where Solidaire was just clearing out downtown. These are one of my earliest memories of downtown is this and then of course someone has to do something Munal Halla is brought up later in the book uh, I once had this exchange with her it was just it was too much too fast overnight Marder Square became a parking lot Feiruz did her concert in 1994 I was in Marder Square already or old enough to realize mm. How did all this space happen within a year? There was a shocking end to downtown that maybe was it just a bit too much. You see it as an end, I see it as a new beginning. That's well said. I think you're I think maybe both are right. I will not get too emotional about Martyrs Square, but I will notice I will acknowledge at least. It has become a place where And you have the corona. This is one of the collage. And we've, uh, Actually, I've seen this photo before online, so I thought it was kind of funny to put that there. I go there because people are buried there. So when I go to <laughs> Mother Square, I think of, well, I think of the guy who's behind us here. He's buried in Mother Square. So it, it has this other layer to me. But even without that story, I always found special meaning, and I think a lot of us do. And this unique part of the city that keeps redefining our history as time passes. So it would be a very strange to skip Martyr Square in this Yeah, book. of course. And I think it makes sense. It's kind of dead smack in the center. The Fist. You mentioned earlier a generation's gap. I feel the same way when I see The Fist because I know that is something only the next generation could do. $500. Quickly put it together in the middle of the night, set it up. And suddenly there's a defining symbol, symbol. in the middle of the protests. So uh, people were not meeting anymore at the uh, Martyr Square, they yeah. were meeting at the Fist. Right. That's huge. You even acknowledged Tariq Shheb, yes. who, who designed it? I mean. And it was the last. Uh, the last. Uh, 
um, location or the last uh, I call it steps mm. it was so it was 10 and then the Beirut blast happened so it was 10 plus 1 10, 10 what? 10, ten, ten stops on, oh in the, the book in the yeah. book sorry sorry yes yeah locations mm, mm. so so it was 10 plus 1 yeah and then I was like thinking the the uh, the October 17th should have a mark in Beirut. Mm. It cannot just pass unnoticed without a mark in the city. Yep. And I said, I should include the fist as one of the stops. And we decided to go like, it was the, it was the elections, uh, during the elections. And uh, I decided like to, to, go, to do the, the photo shoot uh, election next like, uh, on Sunday, I think, or on Monday, mm, mm. and the same night, it was on fire. It was okay. not there anymore. You mentioned this in the book. It's burned three times. Yes. And I remember the first two times. I forgot that what exists today is just a bad replica. Yeah, it's a it's a smaller, less. I don't know. I don't know why they put it back. They shouldn't have it back. It should be like it was a moment in Lebanese history, and it should remain there. This is the only stop in the book that's that not doesn't there. exist. Yeah. yeah, that's a deliberate decision that you wanted. Yes, because yeah. it it's it's a strong uh, a mark. It's a mark. The fist is not so, the mark. Uh, it resembles uh, a generation of people who protested, mm. and it very much looks like uh, a tweet <laughs> or a post. It's never there. It didn't happen. Even when it was burned three times. It's just and brought like back. a post. It like just, a, hmm. You have to go back hmm, hmm. in the timeline to find it. And it means nothing after. Would you then put Martyrs Square as the landmark that defines the two? Meaning, yeah, of course. Like yeah. this is this is uh, this is a national icon. Yeah, that's a moment in history for its generation. And there happened to be in the same yeah. vicinity. Yeah, yeah. I my relationship to the fist is a little detached, even though I looked at it almost every day during the protests, even though I'd go to it, but it felt like this was a more I think Tata even mentions this at some point, that he's looking for that sign that would be all-encompassing. He's debating between the victory sign and the yes. fist. He goes with the fist. I enjoyed it when it was... When the protests were happening and seeing it being pulled up and then being brought back, that to me was, it was an important statement, but it didn't have that emotional grip on me. It's a social media moment. Yeah, yeah. It's a post on Instagram, but it was so strong. Yeah. And there was lots of media attention around it. It became symbolic. And then younger people started to learn to, to consider it a reference, a loca yeah. their location. Yeah. And uh, the media made this the whole hype around it. And it's nice. It's very visual. It's very visual. Tata even says it, I think... Uh he wanted it to naturally fit yeah. in. He wasn't trying to force it in. But it's the next generation's moment. Yeah. But it's gone. It's not there. It's gone. Something, because the yeah. whole the whole revolution thing is gone. It it's it's symbolic, even in that sense. There's something that's there today, it doesn't really uh, it doesn't match it. It's small it's and fake. It's fake. And here you have... It's not about small or or big. It, it's fake. It's not yeah. the thing. It's not the fist. <laughs> Something that's not fake and still there somehow mm. is the egg. Now you gave it all of its names. The dome, the egg. Yeah. There's another one you gave it. I, the name escapes me now. Uh, the shell or... I don't remember the... There's several nicknames to this building. But the egg is where I met Jad al-Khuri. The egg is where I listen to people talk, lecture during the protests. The egg is where I've been to to see, to see cultural venues before October 17. Michael Jackson's moonwalking tribute was in the egg. Rave parties, 
all types of odd eccentric activities, you finally put the backstory to the egg, city center, city palace, and you found incredible photos, I don't know where you got these from, of the way the egg looked as you'd enter the cinema. I loved this photo. City palace in a shopping mall. I can't imagine this today. Yeah. How hard is it to find these fo- photos? You found the right ones. This, I'm, uh, this it's research. I enjoy yeah. researching and looking and, and asking questions. and It's a journey. Like for me, it's a journey of two years looking for the right photos, right people to tell the story and then listening to the stories and then coming up with a new story. But this story is a strange story because it survives the war. Everything else is knocked down. Everything. And all that's left today is just a strange spaceship-looking structure. Structure, yeah. And it was brought back to life during the protests, but it's sleeping again. You called it, I think, Sleeping Beauty? Is that right? Did I? You referred to it as like, there's one Maybe, of the, yeah. I think, yeah, Sleeping Beauty was the, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know if it's ble- beautiful, sometimes but sure. I, I, <laughs> I read such things sometimes. But I didn't know, Zevin, without you, I would have never known. It's owned by a Saudi investor yes. who refuses to touch it. No, it's part of the of the agreement. They cannot uh, do anything about the... Uh, Sorry, it refuses to redevelop the property. No, they they won't, but the, 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 whole, the whole area is free. They cannot invest in it now. But mm. part of the mm. contract is they, they have to keep the egg, the egg shape. Right. Uh, and I, th- I think the owners, uh, today Saudi owners, they love the property and uh-huh. they just bought it because it was for sale. No one else was interested. But they're not. Uh, they're they're not investing. I, I the think they had plan. Like yeah, I, I yeah. think they had plans, and then suddenly, like everybody, every everybody felt that they own the the egg, yeah. and it's something. It it cannot be private. Uh, and like, this is a private property, and it doesn't identify the egg. Doesn't identify the city. It's 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 just a strange structure there. It's a stranger structure because it's not. And it wasn't meant to be that way. It's exposed. You can still sit inside without the yeah. seats. You can listen to people talk, but like you said, it's kind of it's an odd structure. Yeah, so but but it's a privately owned structure. Like mm. it, it's not national heritage. No, it's and not, if yeah. we need place to talk, you have like lots of other places to talk. Go to UNESCO. I think the funkiness of the building. Yeah, it's funky. It, yeah. It, like, I wish the government does a culture or the Ministry of Culture does a project or the municipality or whoever does, m- makes this place a, a cultural center for people to come and talk. But then I don't believe in the government's ability to run such a place. Well said. The people have, ran, have somehow run it during protests. Um, all the important discussions I heard were in the egg. I saw people running up the ladder, which is so dangerous. The wobbly It was ladder. a moment. It was a it moment. Was a moment. Yeah. But it's, it ended. I think, that's, uh, I think that's a good way to describe it. But it's, I mean, even Jal Khuri's paint is still there. But the egg is, uh, is still there. And the, the kiss. And the kiss, yeah. That's, I've seen that photo before. It's a fantastic shot. And you have the wobbly ladder that people risk their lives. I wanted to meet the photographer, mm. and I couldn't meet her yet. Why, she ran away from you when you reached yeah, out? Yeah, I have this, like... <laughs> no, no, I, I've sent her a book, yeah. and I wanted to see her, and we couldn't meet, and it's so strange. I want to meet this photographer. Well, if she's watching or listening, yeah, Zevin's looking for you. I did not appreciate this stop at first. Mm-hmm. I wondered why it was there, and then I understood it better. Al uh, Khanda, Beshura, Anna. For me, it was one of the stops on the tour that I used to give until it became risky. 
I was stopped many times for walking into this neighborhood by all types of self-proclaimed security mm. for parties that I will not reference right now. But I like Beshura, the old uh, Assyrian church that has now been restored was not back then. There were a lot of green line memories, a lot of majestic buildings too, but architecture abandoned. And then it became really BDD, which to me is, it's the most strange gentrification story. You go from drug addicts and prostitutes and civil war memory to hipsters with Urbanista doing digital coding and all that. But this actually was a great connection or a great, uh, I think you used the word tawasil on this chapter. Yeah. Yeah. I thought of but it also it's a, it's a poor area of Beirut. I think it's a little bit unfair to... This part of Al Khanda to me has become like a schism where you have AUB and BDD next to a very humble and yes, a deserted poor. area. Yeah, that section of Al Khanda, absolutely. Consider it the homeless uh, mm. neighborhood of Beirut. But you see such neighborhoods even in New York. That's true. Even in London, even in Paris. But the thing is, for me, the, the philosophy behind this, it's, it was not Khanda al mm. It was be, because all the buildings I had till now are like the star buildings, are the famous buildings. Oh, okay. And this was a tribute to buildings. Right. Normal people. I thought there was that other meaning behind No, no, no. It. This was oh, like, okay. those were like, like just buildings yeah. they are they were meant to be buildings they had they were not famous they meant nothing even in in the uh, like in the history of Beirut like just building neighbor, uh, residential this an mm-hmm. old residential mm-hmm. neighborhood so they were like this is like this is those are the people buildings if you want and they had the meaning when someone started to to draw on them mm-hmm. you know so so it was a tribute to to, be, to buildings that are not famous, but still they are buildings and they are part of Beirut. And they're right, they're just south of the ring. Yeah. So in so a way, it's also a nice... Uh, so it was a tribute to, hmm. to it's not, you, like, it's not only, not everyone is famous. You focus, though, on, on, a, on a mural. The mural, yeah. And I forgot his name now. Ho- Jorge. Direction. Yeah, it's a uh, Cuban-American... What's his last name? Jorge something. I should have it somewhere. Anyway, Jorge Sanchez Gurada. You don't remember either. Good. No, no, no. It's <laughs> that's right. it, yeah, it, it, so there was one guy that... Yeah. yeah. He's uh, a famous uh, mural artist. And he has his like paintings in different capitals in the world mm. or cities in the world. And it was this whole project to do the whole neighborhood. Was this stop included after October 17th? No, no, no. It was one of the main stops because I wanted oh, yeah. buildings that were not famous, just ordinary buildings. Okay, I, d- I, didn't, I didn't know that. So it's really just That were becoming like artwork. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because it was a tribute to ordinary buildings. This, is, this is the heart of Beirut. Phoenicia, or not Phoenicia, this is the heart of Beirut. Holiday Inn is not the heart of mm. Beirut. Mm. This is the heart of Beirut. But to be this is residential. That's an hotel mm. for foreigners and tourists. But to be fair, this building, which I know quite well, I think there's only one person still living in one apartment, maybe, that's completely empty. The architecture is stunning. So even the ordinary of war torn Beirut. It's stunning before because, like, because it's old. <laughs> you have a way of redefining it, which I like. You know, it's actually quite nice to have different... Perspectives. Yeah, yeah. And I see the Khanda. I always have different... Uh, I, I look at things from mm. a totally different angle. This is how my brain operates. I, I see different angles. I think different angles defines Beit Beirut. Yes, of course. How many... I mean, every single angle that could go right and wrong in one building. Mona al thanks to her, we have a museum, a cultural center now. Uh... The Barakat building, I, I appreciated the way you you spoke. It's almost like the entire backstory of how the Barakat family and Yusuf Aftimos and all of this 
magic happens 90 years ago or so. And then you fast forward, Beirut is being built and this building is shining. The, the tram stop in Nasra, I've heard of that. I didn't know it's right there. The, the Nasra stop is actually at the entrance to Beit al -Barakat. And of course, the way it's designed, it's perfect for snipers. And then yeah. the entire tragedy that unfolds. And just the whole architecture, yeah, it's very original. It's it was very new for the time until till today. And this is very original. You know, this linking two buildings this yes, way. Yes, right. So it's you made reference to Kamel Salibi here. You said this is a this is a mansion. This building is a house, house of man many mansions. Yes. Yeah, I wanted you to explain what you meant by that. Is it that the layers? Yeah, different layers. Different stories, different backgrounds, different eras of Beirut. The whole evolution, you can tell the whole evolution of the residential part of Beirut, mm. not the touristic part of Beirut, mm, mm, mm. through this building. It's the heart of Beirut. It's the Beirut of the Lebanese, not mm, Beirut mm. of the tourists. This is not Holiday Inn. This is not St. George. It's, mm. tourist, it's, it's like touristic culture is very different than a residential culture. Like go to Paris, go to the touristic areas and go to the residential parts of Paris. It's totally different. So this building stands in the 50s, 40s, 50s, 60s as to the whole evolution of the residential part of Beirut, where the Beirutis and the Lebanese really worked, lived, everything. So this is the heart of the city. And then you see the whole change and then war mm. during the war it was a, a war machine and actually thankfully the uh yusuf haider is that the architect, the architect yes. yeah he managed to preserve enough of that that you can actually still explore that yes. chapter i i i mean i really credit Munal halla for being able to do something special like that and it shows that one person can yeah. help save one building um, and of course we talked about her here mm -hmm. and also like i consider myself as being part of preserving this building because one of the first like the first time mona Halla met the owners of the building was yeah. in my show in future television oh. where the owner at that time told her well go forget about this building go have a family or but something fa yeah yeah yeah, yeah yeah go really? go i don't remember what he said but go like Go marry that was or on something. Your show. Yeah, it was on my show in the middle of the discussion where the owners want, wanted to put it down. And Muna Halla with her friends were demonstrating yeah. against it. And this is like one of the first social movements. Yes, like, yes. Uh, I didn't know it's civil from the show. Like uh, the civil society movements in the city. So the Barakat family wanted to knock it down yes of course because uh, it, it, for them it's an investment it's yeah. an it's a ruined building it's a building that they couldn't it's their mm -hmm. own building mm -hmm. and it was occupied by the militias well then i will bring you up the next time i bring up this building that it was on zaven's show <laughs> that mona and the Berekat family square i did not know that so we're going to wrap it up with the one stop that we all know so well do we but we don't, because we know where it is. We know what we know a lot of what's inside, but we don't have much appreciation for it. We end the journey or our tour, the Beirut Kitty Pleasures tour here, not because of the museum itself, but because a hole in the museum. Yeah, you mentioned this actually, the Good Shepherd. So uh, it's all yeah. about the hole. Yeah, I think a hole because this is also one of the. St one of the like the moments or the places or the worlds where where uh, it's 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 one of the like the living it's a living memory of the war it's a hole in the museum there's something maybe about the green line itself that it's the marker still of where the two sides met and also that Lebanese identity hasn't really what do you mean in the in the architecture of the museum Every time there's an exhibit that's near it or trying to celebrate it, it's complicated. Alfred uh, Tarazi had, a, some, had something recently that was removed. Um, 
Unless you're into antiquity, maybe the museum is not really for everyone. I actually prefer Beit Beirut as a museum. And I know it's not the same emphasis, I know that. But I think this one but is But you just, should have this and you should have that. Yeah, you're right. Both you're of right. them can coexist and they are close to each other. And they yeah. tell the story of, like, this is more educational, this yeah. is more like a, a, a touristic landmark. And yeah. this is where you know that it, that history doesn't start from you, with you. Mm -hmm. This is where, like, it's the whole depth. The whole, like, the, the heart of Beirut was about to be to be freezed in time because they found a stone underneath a building that was ruined. No, you're you're right. I'm I'm a bit hard on Matthaf, maybe yeah, because you hate I, the Matthaf. No, why? not not hate, but it's what you said earlier. It's that it's one piece, but it's not for me. It's not the most pressing one. You maybe. cannot have everything in the Matthaf. This Matthaf is the house of ancient history of. Lebanon. You were right. You know what? I think because it is, it is part of the golden era civil war post war story. It's built pre independence or around that time. Uh, it survives somehow during the war and it's re restored after. I think because its emphasis is on things centuries. Pre yeah, yeah. It's, it's, a mat it's a museum. It's a museum, but it's the same. It's not like it's museum. It's the museum, and You're the right. museum is one of the most boring places that you can go to. For some reason, my my perspective, it kind of skips over Matthaf, but it's a good reminder that I should embrace it a bit. And it's the only museum we have that focuses on that very important <laughs> section of time. So, the book ends with, only cities that survive have scars. Explain that to me. What do you mean? Like, this is in reaching for the city. And uh, we shouldn't be ashamed of those uh, scars. We shouldn't try to remove those scars sometimes. But you cannot keep all the scars. Yeah. You should... Uh, oh, even the scars have a lifespan. A scar f for you might uh, mean nothing to another person or to another generation. So, but it's enriching. It's you, the whole book says has one message that Lebanon has failed to be a message, <laughs> as the Pope said. It's not a message. We should find a meaning to Lebanon. Otherwise, there shouldn't be Lebanon on the map. Because everything should have a meaning. And this is why, like, my biggest concern today, you, we started with my career. What's my meaning? If I don't have a meaning on television, I'm not on television. If I have a meaning, I am on television. Uh, so we should find a meaning. And the meaning that I could think of is we should be a lesson. You recently said... We failed to be a message. So let's be a lesson. On Al Jadid, on uh, May, uh, May, sorry, Nayla Twaini's sister, her name, so Michelle, Michelle Twaini, sorry, Michelle Twaini's show, Beit uh, Shahr, I think, or uh, you said something that caught a bit, sort of, it, it, it was shared quite a bit, it went viral, that you were acknowledging I that. I should add it to my CV now, you remind me. That's your viral <laughs> moment. That you acknowledge that. You're part of the older generation that the youth were protesting against, and that you wanted to. I take described. A step. I didn't acknowledge. Like I described fair, myself. Fair enough. I, you're right. I I positioned myself. You positioned. Well said. You're right. I'll be. Uh, yes, uh, and you wanted to take a step back, and let the next generation have its turn. Um, and I sensed that to prove them wrong. <laughs> <laughs> That is not in that episode. <laughs> <laughs> that's now, because that's <laughs> now you know the truth. <laughs> the, <laughs> the puzzle. That's right? a, talking that's about great. the puzzle. Yeah, that's, yeah. The, that's the other chapter. No. Yeah. <laughs> this is wrong. a podcast. That's on traditional that's TV. Amazing. This is a podcast. Well this said. is the difference between traditional TV and, <laughs> with, uh, and the podcast. Let me be uh, diplomatic. It's no, don't be diplomatic. No, okay, please. so let me try to bridge those two. I think I think you're in the middle. 
like our generation is the one that can reflect this way and i think i wouldn't be hard on i wouldn't discredit the role that you play even though there's a younger generation that has pushed ahead um i think a book like this and the role you you serve not just in media but in collective memory i think it's essential it was a pleasure reading beirut guilty pleasures i may have said beirut shot twice at the beginning it's lebanon shot twice i may have said beirut shot twice um but i think these are actually companion pieces personally i can flip through this book endlessly and you gave me a lot of your time today and i know that your role in lebanese media evolves continuously but it's good to have you back and it was an honor to be on your show and i look forward to seeing you on television screens but also on alternative media you're you're shining today so thanks to you thanks to lori for coming twice and making this happen and zaven this was a real treat thank you appreciate it thank you thanks for listening and watching and a friendly reminder to support this podcast by contributing through Patreon or PayPal. All links are in the details box. Until next time, I'm Rani Shatah, and this is the Beirut Banyan. <laughs>